Chapter 68, Gift of Knowledge. Eyes locked, Aragon and Murtag slowly circled each other, trying to anticipate where and how the other would move. Murtag appeared fit as ever, but there were dark circles under his eyes, and his face was haggard. Aragon suspected that he had been under a great strain. He wore the same pieces of armor as did Aragon, mail hauberk, gauntlets, bracers, and greaves, but his shield was longer and thinner than Aragon's. As for their swords, Brisinger, with its hand and a half hilt, had the advantage of length, while Zorak, with its wider blade, had the advantage of weight. They began to edge closer, and when they were about ten feet apart, Murtag, who had his back to Galbatorix, said in a low, anger-filled voice, "'What are you doing?' "'Buying time,' Aragon muttered, keeping his lips as still as possible. Murtag scowled. "'You're a fool. He'll watch us cut each other to shreds, and what will it change? Nothing!' Instead of answering, Aragon shifted his weight forward and twitched his sword arm, causing Murtag to flinch in response. "'Blast you!' growled Murtag. "'If you had waited just one more day, I could have freed Nasueda. That surprised Aragon. Why should I believe you? The question angered Murtag further, for his lip curled and he quickened his step, causing Aragon to increase his pace as well. Then, in a louder tone, Murtag said, So, you finally found a proper sword for yourself. The elves made it for you, didn't they? You know they did. Murtag lunged toward him, swinging Zorak at his gut, and Aragon skipped backward, barely parrying the red sword. Aragon replied with a looping, overhead blow. He allowed his hand to slide down to Brisinger's pommel to give himself more reach, and Murtag danced out of the way. They both paused to see if the other would attack again. When neither did, they resumed circling, Aragon more worried than before. From their exchange, it was obvious that Murtag was still as fast and as strong as Aragon, or an elf. Galbatorix's prohibition on the use of magic apparently did not extend to the spells that fortified Murtag's limbs. For selfish reasons, Aragon disliked the king's edict, but he could understand the rationale behind it. The fight would hardly have been fair otherwise. But Aragon did not want a fair fight. He wanted to control the course of the duel so that he could decide when it should end and how. Unfortunately, Aragon doubted that he would have the opportunity, given Murtag's skill with the blade, and even if he did, he was not sure how he could use the fight to strike against Galbatorix. Nor did he have time to think about it, though he trusted that Sephira, Arya, and the dragons would try to devise a solution for him. Murtag fainted with his left shoulder, and Aragon ducked behind his shield. An instant later, he realized that it had been a ruse, and that Murtag was moving around toward his right in an attempt to get past his guard. Aragon twisted and saw Zorak arcing toward his neck, the edge a glittering, wire-thin line. He knocked it aside with a clumsy push of Brisinger's crossguard. Then he retaliated with a quick slash at Murtag's lower arm. To his grim delight, he struck Murtag on the side of his wrist. Brisinger failed to cut through Murtag's gauntlet and the sleeve of the tunic beneath, but the impact still hurt Murtag and pushed his arm away from his body, leaving his chest exposed. Aragon stabbed, and Murtag used his shield to deflect the attack. Three more times Aragon stabbed, but Murtag stopped each blow, and when Aragon drew back his arm to strike again, Murtag countered with a backhanded cut at his knee which would have crippled him had it landed. Seeing what Murtag intended, Aragon altered his swing and stopped Zorak an inch from his leg. Then he countered with a cut of his own. For several minutes, they exchanged blows, trying to disrupt each other's rhythms, but to no avail. They knew each other too well. Whatever Aragon attempted, Murtag was able to thwart, and the same was true in reverse. It was like a game where they both had to think many moves in advance, which fostered a certain sense of intimacy as Aragon focused on divining the inner workings of Murtag's mind, and from them, predicting what Murtag would do next. Right from the beginning, Aragon noticed that Murtag was playing the game differently than the previous times they'd fought. He attacked with a ruthlessness that heretofore had been lacking, as if, for the first time, he wanted to defeat Aragon, and quickly too. Moreover, after his initial outburst, his anger seemed to vanish, and he displayed only a cool, implacable de determination. Aragon found himself fighting to the limit of his abilities, and though he was able to hold Murtag off, he ended up on the defensive more than he would have liked. After a while, Murtag lowered his sword and turned toward the throne in Galbatorix. Aragon kept his guard up, but he hesitated, unsure whether it was appropriate to attack. 
In that moment of hesitation, Murtag leaped toward him. Aragorn stood his ground and swung. Murtag caught the blow on his shield, and then, instead of following up with a strike of his own as Aragorn expected, he slammed his shield against Aragorn's and pushed. Aragorn growled and pushed back. He would have reached around his shield to slash at Murtag's back or legs, but Murtag was shoving too hard for Aragorn to risk it. Murtag was an inch or two taller, and the extra height allowed him to bear down on Aragorn's shield in a way that made it difficult for Aragorn to keep from sliding back across the polished stone floor. At last, with a roar and a mighty heave, Murtag sent Aragorn stumbling away. As Aragorn flailed and struggled to regain his balance, Murtag stabbed at his neck. Lada, said Galvatorix. The tip of Zorak stopped less than a finger's breadth from Aragorn's skin. He froze, panting, not sure what had just happened. Restrain yourself, Murtag, or I shall do it for you, said Galbatorix, where he sat watching. I dislike having to repeat myself. You are not to kill Aragorn, nor is he to kill you. Now, continue. The realization that Murtag had just tried to kill him, and that he would have succeeded if not for Galbatorix's intervention, shocked Aragorn. He searched Murtag's face for an explanation, but Murtag remained stubbornly expressionless as if Aragon meant little or nothing to him. Aragon could not understand. Murtag was definitely playing the game differently than he ought to be. Something had changed in him, but what it was, Aragon could not tell. In addition, the knowledge that he had lost, that, by all rights, he should be dead, undermined Aragon's confidence. He had confronted death many times before, but never in such a stark and uncompromising manner. There was no question of it. Murtag had bested him, and only Galbatorix's mercy, such as it was, had saved him. Aragon, do not dwell on it, said Arya. You had no reason to suspect he would try to kill you, nor were you trying to kill him. If you had, the fight would have gone differently, and Murtag would never have had the chance to attack you as he did. Doubtful, Aragon glanced over to where she stood by the edge of the pool of light, along with Elva and Saphira. Then Saphira said, If he wishes to rip out your throat... Then cut his hamstrings, and make sure that he cannot do it again. Aragon nodded, acknowledging what they had said. He and Murtag separated, and again took up their positions opposite each other, while Gabatorix looked on approvingly. This time, Aragon was the first to attack. They fought for what felt like hours. Murtag did not attempt any more killing blows, whereas Aragon, to his satisfaction, succeeded in touching Murtag on the collarbone although he stopped the blow before Galvatorix saw fit to do so himself. Murtag looked unsettled at the touch, and Aragon allowed himself a brief smile at Murtag's reaction. There were other blows that they failed to block as well. For all their speed and skill, neither he nor Murtag was infallible, and without an easy means to end the fight, it was inevitable that they would make mistakes and that those mistakes would result in injuries. The first wound was a cut Murtag gave Aragon on his right thigh, and the gap between the edge of his hauberk and the upper part of his greave. It was a shallow cut, but exceedingly painful, and every time Aragon put his weight on the leg, blood surged from the wound. The second wound was also Aragon's, a gash above one eyebrow after Murtag landed a blow upon his helm, and the edge of it drove into his flesh. Of the two wounds, Aragon found the second by far the most aggravating, because blood kept dripping into his eye, obscuring his vision. Then Aragon caught Murtag on the wrist again, and this time sliced all the way through the cuff of his gauntlet, the sleeve of his tunic, and a thin layer of skin to the bone beneath. He failed to sever any muscles, but the wound seemed to pain Murtag a great deal, and the blood that seeped into his gauntlet caused him to lose his grip at least twice. Aragon took a nick to his right calf, and then, when Murtag was still recovering from a failed attack, he moved around to Murtag's shield side and brought down Berzinger as hard as he could upon the middle of Murtag's left greave, denting the steel. Murtag howled and jumped back on one leg. Aragon followed, swinging Brisinger in an attempt to batter him to the floor. Despite his injury, Murtag was able to defend himself, and a few seconds later, Aragon was the one who was hard-pressed to remain on his feet. For a time, their shields resisted the relentless pounding. Galbatorix, Aragon was pleased to realize, had left intact the enchantments upon their swords and armor. But then the spells on Aragon's shield gave way, as did those on Murtag's, which was apparent from the chips and splinters that flew every time their swords landed. Soon afterward, 
Aragon cracked Murtag's shield with a particularly heavy blow. His victory was short-lived, for Murtag grasped Zorak with both hands and struck at Aragon's own shield twice in quick succession, and it split as well, leaving them equally matched once again. As they fought, the stone beneath them grew slippery with smears and splashes of blood, and it became increasingly difficult to keep their footing. The massive presence chamber returned distant echoes of their clashing weapons, like the sounds of a long-forgotten battle, and it felt as if they were the center of all that existed, for theirs was the only light, and the two of them were alone within its compass. And all the while, Galbatorix and Shrukin continued to watch from within the bordering shadows. Without their shields, Aragon found it easier to land blows upon Murtag, mainly upon his arms and legs, even as it was easier for Murtag to do the same to him. For the most part, their armor protected them from cuts, but it did not protect them from lumps and bruises, of which they accrued many. In spite of the wounds he gave Murtag, Aragon began to suspect that, of the two of them, Murtag was the better swordsman. Not by much, but enough that Aragon was never really able to gain the upper hand. If the course of their duel continued, Murtag would end up wearing him down until he was too hurt or too tired to go on, an outcome that seemed to be fast approaching. With every step, Aragon could feel the blood gushing over his knee from the cut on his thigh, and with every moment that passed, it became harder to defend himself. He had to end the duel now, or else he would be unable to take on Galvatorix afterward. As it was, he doubted he would pose much of a challenge to the king, but he had to try. If nothing else, he had to try. The heart of the problem, he realized, was that Murtag's reasons for fighting were a mystery to him, and unless he could figure them out, Murtag would continue to catch him by surprise. Aragon thought back to what Glader had told him outside Drasleona. You must learn to see what you are looking at. And also, The way of the warrior is the way of knowing. So he looked at Murtag. He looked at him with the same intensity with which he had gazed upon Arya during their sparring sessions. The same intensity with which he had studied himself during his long night of introspection on Vroengard. By it, he sought to decipher the hidden language of Murtag's body. He met with some success. It was clear that Murtag was drawn and hard-worn, and that his shoulders were hunched in a way that spoke of deep-rooted anger, or perhaps it was fear. And then there was his ruthlessness, hardly a new characteristic, but newly applied to Aragon. Those things Aragon discerned, along with other, subtler details. And then he strove to reconcile them with what he knew of Murtag from days past, with his friendship and his loyalty and his resentment of Galbatorix's control. It took a few seconds, seconds filled with strained breathing and a pair of awkward blows that gained him another bruise on his elbow, until the truth came to Aragon. It seemed so obvious when it did. There had to be something in Murtag's life, something their duel would affect, that was so important to Murtag, he felt compelled to win by any means necessary, even if that meant killing his own half-brother. Whatever that something was, and Aragon had his suspicions, some more disturbing than others. It meant that Murtag would never give up. It meant that Murtag would fight like a cornered animal until his very last breath, and it meant that Aragon would never be able to defeat him through conventional measures, for the duel did not mean as much to him as it did to Murtag. For Aragon, the duel was a convenient distraction, and he cared little who won or lost as long as he was still able to face Galbatorix afterward. But for Murtag, the duel was of far more significance. And from experience, Aragon knew that determination such as his was costly, if not impossible, to overcome by force alone. The question, then, was how to stop a man who has resolved to persist and prevail in spite of whatever obstacles barred his way. It was an unsolvable conundrum, until at last, Aragon realized that the only way to best Murtag was to give him what he wanted. In order to achieve his own desire, Aragon would have to accept defeat. But not entirely. He could not leave Murtag free to carry out Gabatorix's bidding. Aragon would grant Murtag his victory, and then he would take his own. As she listened to his thoughts, Saphir's anguish and concern grew more pronounced, and she said, No, Aragon, there must be another way. Then tell me what it is, he said, for I cannot see it. She snarled, and Thorn growled back at her from across the pool of light. Choose wisely, said Arya, and Aragon understood her meaning. Murtag rushed at him, and their blades met with a clamorous ring, and then they disengaged and paused a moment to gather their strength. As they started toward each other once again, 
Aragon sidled to Murtag's right, while at the same time allowing his sword arm to drift away from the side of his body, as if through exhaustion or carelessness. It was a slight motion, but he knew that Murtag would notice, and that he would attempt to exploit the opening he had provided. At that moment, Aragon felt nothing. He still registered the pain from his wounds, but at a remove, as if the sensations were not his own. His mind was like a pool of deep water on a breathless day, flat and motionless, and yet filled with the reflection of those things around it. What he saw, he registered without conscious thought. The need for that had passed. He understood all that was before him, and further contemplation would only hamper him. As Aragon expected, Murtag lunged toward him, stabbing at the middle of his belly. When the time was ripe, Aragon turned. He moved neither fast nor slow, but at just the right speed the situation required. The motion felt preordained, as if it were the only action he could have taken. Instead of striking him in the gut, as Murtag had intended, Zorak struck Aragon in the muscles along his right side, directly below his ribcage. The impact felt like a hammer blow, and there was a steely slither as Zorak slid past the broken links of his mail and into his flesh. The coldness of the metal made Aragon gasp more than the pain itself. Behind him, the tip of the blade tugged at his hauberk as it emerged from his body. Murtag stared, seemingly taken aback. Before Murtag could recover, Aragon drew back his arm and thrust Brisinger into Murtag's abdomen, close to his navel, a far worse wound than the one Aragon had just received. Murtag's face went slack. His mouth opened as if he were going to speak, and he fell to his knees, still clutching Zorak. Off to the side, Thorn roared. Aragon pulled Brisinger free, then stepped back and grimaced in a soundless howl as Zorak slid out of his body. There was a clatter as Murtag released Zorak and it dropped to the floor. Then he wrapped his arms around his waist, doubled over, and pressed his head against the polished stone. Now Aragon was the one to stare, hot blood dripping into one eye. From on his throne, Galvatorik said, Naina, and dozens of lanterns throughout the chamber sprang to life once again revealing the pillars and carvings along the wall, and the block of stone where Nasueda stood chained. Aragon staggered over to Murtag and knelt next to him. "'And to Aragon goes the victory,' said the king, his sonorous voice filling the great hall. Murtag looked up at Aragon, his sweat-beaded face contorted with pain. "'You couldn't just let me win, could you?' he growled in an undertone. "'You can't beat Galbatorics.' but you still had to prove that you are better than me. Ah! He shuddered and began to rock back and forth upon his shins. Aragon put a hand on his shoulder. Why? he asked, knowing that Murtag would understand the question. The answer came as a barely audible whisper. Because I hoped to gain his favor, so that I could save her. Tears blurred Murtag's eyes, and he looked away. At that, Aragon realized that Murtag had been telling the truth earlier and he felt a sense of dismay. Another moment passed, and Aragon was aware of Galbatorix watching them with keen interest. Then Murtag said, "'You tricked me. It was the only way.' Murtag grunted. "'That was always the difference between you and me.' He eyed Aragon. "'You were willing to sacrifice yourself. I wasn't. Not then. But you are now. I'm not the person I once was. I have Thorn now, and—' Murtag hesitated. Then his shoulders rose and fell in a tiny shrug. I'm not fighting for myself anymore. It makes a difference. He took a shallow breath and winced. I used to think you were a fool to keep risking your life as you have. I know better now. I understand. Why? I understand. His eyes widened and his grimace relaxed, as if his pain was forgotten, and an inner light seemed to illuminate his features. I understand. We understand, he whispered and Thorn uttered a strange sound that was half whimper and half growl. Galbatorix stirred on his throne, as if uneasy, and in a harsh voice he said, Enough of this talk! Your duel is over, and Aragon has won. Now the time has arrived for our guests to bend their knees and give me their oaths of fealty. Come closer, the both of you, and I shall heal your wounds, and then we shall proceed. Aragon started to stand. But Murtag grabbed his forearm, stopping him. No, said Galbatorix, his heavy brows drawing together. Or I will leave you to suffer from your wounds until we have finished. Ready yourself, Murtag mouthed to Aragon. Aragon hesitated, 
not sure what to expect. Then he nodded and warned Arya, Saphira, Glader, and the other Eldenari. Then Murtag pushed Aragon aside, and he rose up on his knees, still clutching his belly. He looked at Galvatorix, and he shouted the word. Galvatorix recoiled and lifted a hand, as if to shield himself. Still shouting, Murtag voiced other words in the ancient language, speaking too quickly for Aragon to understand the purpose of his spell. The air around Galbatorix flashed red and black, and for an instant, his body appeared to be wreathed in flames. There was a sound like that of a high summer wind stirring the branches of an evergreen forest. Then Aragon heard a series of thin shrieks as twelve orbs of light appeared around Galbatorix's head and fled outward from him, and passed through the walls of the chamber and thus vanished. They looked like spirits, but Aragon saw them for such a brief span, he could not be certain. Thorn spun around, as fast as a cat whose tail has been stepped on, and he pounced on Trugan's immense neck. The black dragon bellowed and scrambled backward, shaking his head in an attempt to throw Thorn off. The noise of his growls was painfully loud, and the floor shook from the weight of the two dragons. On the steps of the dais, the two children screamed and covered their ears with their hands. Aragon saw Arya, Elva, and Saphira lurch forward, no longer bound by Galbatorix's magic. Douth dart in hand, Arya started toward the throne, while Saphira loped toward where Cl Thorn clung to Shrukin. Meanwhile, Elva put her hand to her mouth and seemed to say something to herself, but what it was, Aragon could not hear over the sound of the dragons. Fist-sized drops of blood rained down around them and lay smoking on the stone. Aragon rose from where Murtag had pushed him, and he followed Arya to the throne. Then Galbatorix spoke the name of the ancient language, along with the word Leda. Invisible bonds seized hold of Aragon's limbs, and throughout the chamber, silence fell as the king's magic restrained everyone, even Trukin. Rage and frustration boiled within Aragon. They had been so close to striking at the king, and yet they were still helpless before his spells. Get him! he shouted, both with his mind and his tongue. They had already tried to attack Galbatorix and Shrukin. The king would kill the two children whether or not they continued. The only path left to Aragon and those with him, the only hope of victory that yet remained, was to break past Galbatorix's mental barriers and seize control of his thoughts. Along with Saphira and Arya and the Eldunari they had brought with them, Aragon stabbed outward with his consciousness toward the king, pouring all of his hate, anger, and pain into the single burning ray that he drove into the center of Galbatorix's being. For an instant, Aragon felt the king's mind, a terrible, shadow-ridden vista swept with bitter cold and searing heat, ruled by bars of iron, hard and unyielding, which portioned off areas of his consciousness. Then the dragons under Galbatorix's command, the mad, howling, grief-stricken dragons, attacked Aragon's mind and forced him to withdraw within himself to avoid being torn to pieces. Behind him, Aragon heard Elva start to say something, but she had barely uttered a sound when Galbatorix said, Dana, and she stopped with a choked gurgle. I stripped him of his wards, shouted Murtag. He's... Whatever Galbatorix said, it was too fast and too low for Aragon to catch, but Murtag ceased speaking, and a moment later, Aragon heard him fall to the floor with a tinkle of mail and the sharp clink of his helm striking stone. I have plenty of wards, said Galbatorix his hawk-like face dark with fury. You cannot harm me. He rose from his seat and strode down the steps of the dais toward Aragon, his cape billowing around him and his sword, Ronger, white and deathly in his hand. In the brief time he had, Aragon tried to capture the mind of at least one of the dragons battering at his consciousness, but there were too many, and his attempt left him scrambling to repel the horde of Eldunari before they completely subjugated his thoughts. Galbatorix stopped a foot in front of him and glared at him, a thick, forked vein prominent on his brow, the muscles of his heavy jaw nodding. Thank you to challenge me, boy, he growled, fairly spitting with rage. Thank you to be my equal, that you could lay me low and steal my throne. The cords in Galbatorix's neck stood out like a skine of twisted rope. He plucked at the edge of his cape. I cut this mantle from the wings of Beglabod himself. And my gloves, too. He lifted Ronger and held its bleak blade before Aragon's eyes. I took this sword from Rael's hand, and I took this crown from the head of the mewling wretch who wore it before me. And yet you think to outwit me, me, 
You come to my castle, and you kill my men, and you act as if you are better than I, as if you are more noble or virtuous. Aragon's head rang, and a constellation of throbbing, swirling, crimson motes appeared before his eyes, as Galbatorix struck him on the cheek with Ronger's pommel, tearing his skin. You need to be taught a lesson in humility, boy, said Galbatorix, moving closer, until his gleaming eyes were mere inches from Aragon's. He struck Aragon on the other cheek, and for a second, all Aragon could see was a black immensity littered with flashing lights. I shall enjoy having you in my service, said Galbatorix. In a lower voice, he said, Ganja, and the pressure from the Eldunari assailing Aragon's mind vanished, leaving him free to think as he would. But not so the others, as he could see from the strain on their faces. Then a blade of thought, honed to an infinitesimal point, pierced Aragon's consciousness and sheathed itself in the marrow of his being. The blade twisted, and like a cockle burr lodged within a bat of felt, it tore at the fabric of his mind, seeking to destroy his will, his identity, his very awareness. It was an attack unlike any Aragon had experienced. He shrank from it and concentrated upon a single thought, revenge, as he struggled to protect himself. Through their contact, he could feel Galvatorix's emotions, anger mainly, but also a savage joy at being able to hurt Aragon and watch him writhe in discomfort. The reason, Aragon realized, that Galvatorix was so good at breaking the minds of his enemies was because it gave him a perverse pleasure. The blade dug deeper into Aragon's being, and he howled, unable to help himself. Galbatorx smiled, the edges of his teeth translucent, like fired clay. Defense alone was no way to win a fight, and so, despite the searing pain, Aragon forced himself to attack Galbatorix in return. He dove into the king's consciousness and grasped at his razor-sharp thoughts, trying to pin them in place and prevent the king from moving or thinking without his approval. Galbatorix made no attempt to guard himself, however. His cruel smile widened, and he twisted the blade in Aragon's mind even further. It felt to Aragon as if a nest of briars were ripping him apart from the inside. A scream racked his throat, and he went limp in the grip of Galbatorix's spell. Submit, said the king. He grabbed Aragon's chin with fingers of steel. Submit! The blade twisted yet again, and Aragon screamed until his voice gave out. The king's probing thoughts closed in around Aragon's consciousness, restricting him to an ever smaller part of his mind, until all that was left to him was a small, bright nub overshadowed by the looming weight of Galbatorix's presence. Submit, whispered the king, almost lovingly. You have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. This life is at an end for you, Aragon Shadeslayer, but a new one awaits. Submit, and all shall be forgiven. Tears distorted Aragon's vision as he stared into the featureless abyss of Galbatorix's pupils. They had lost. He had lost. The knowledge was more painful than any of the wounds he had received. A hundred years' worth of striving, all for naught. Sephira, Elva, Arya, the Eldunari, none of them could overcome Galbatorix. He was too strong, too knowledgeable. Garo and Brahm and Aromas had all died in vain, as had the many warriors of different races who had laid down their lives in the course of fighting the Empire. The tears spilled from Aragon's eyes. Submit, whispered the king, and his grip tightened. More than anything, it was the injustice of the situation that Aragon hated. It seemed wrong on a fundamental level that so many had suffered and died in pursuit of a hopeless goal. It seemed wrong that Galbatorix alone should be the cause of so much misery. And it seemed wrong that he should escape punishment for his misdeeds. Why? Aragon asked himself. He remembered, then, the vision the oldest of the Eldenari, Valder, had shown him in Sephira, where the dreams of starlings were equal to the concerns of kings. Submit! shouted Galbatorix, and his mind bore down on Aragon with even greater force as splinters of ice and fire lanced through him from every direction. Aragon cried out, and in his desperation he reached for Sephira and the Eldenari their minds besieged by the crazed dragons of Galbatorix's command, and, without intending to, he drew from their stores of energy. And with that energy, he cast a spell. It was a spell without words, for Galbatorix's magic would not allow otherwise, and no words could have described what Aragon wanted, nor what he felt. A library of books would have been insufficient to the task. His was a spell of instinct and emotion, 
Language could not contain it. What he wanted was both simple and complex. He wanted Galvatorix to understand. To understand the wrongness of his actions. The spell was not an attack. It was an attempt to communicate. If Aragon was going to spend the rest of his life as a slave to the king, then he wanted Galvatorix to comprehend what he had done, fully and completely. As the magic took effect, Aragon felt Umaroth and the Eldunari turn their attention to his spell, fighting to ignore Galvatorix's dragons. A hundred years of inconsolable grief and anger welled up within the Eldunari, like a roaring wave, and the dragons melded their minds with Aragon's and began to alter the spell, deepening it, widening it, and building upon it until it encompassed far more than he had originally intended. Not only would the spell show Galvatorix the wrongness of his actions, now it would also compel him to experience all the feelings, both good and bad, that he had aroused in others since the day he had been born. The spell was beyond anything Aragon could have invented on his own, for it contained more than a single person or a single dragon could conceive of. Each Eldunari contributed to the en enchantment, and the sum of their contributions was a spell that extended not only across the whole of Alagasia, but also back through every moment in time between then and Galvatorix's birth. It was, Aragon thought, the greatest piece of magic the dragons had ever wrought, and he was their instrument, he was their weapon. The power of the Eldunari rushed through him, like a river as wide as an ocean, and he felt a hollow and fragile vessel, as if his skin might tear with the force of the torrent he channeled. If not for Sephira and the other dragons, he would have died in an instant, drained of all strength by the voracious demands of the magic. Around them, the light of the lanterns dimmed, and in his mind, Aragon seemed to hear the echo of thousands of voices, an unbearable cacophony of pains and joys innumerable, echoing forth from both the present and the past. The lines upon Galvatorix's face deepened, and his eyes began to bulge from their sockets. "'What have you done?' he said, his voice hollow and strained. He stepped back and put his fists to his temples. "'What have you done?' With an effort, Aragon said, "'Made you understand.' The king stared at him with an expression of horror. The muscles of his face jumped and twitched, and his whole body began to shake with tremors. Baring his teeth, he growled, "'You will not get the better of me, boy. You will not.' He groaned and staggered, and all at once the spell holding Aragon vanished, and he fell to the floor, even as Elva, Arya, Sephira, Thorn, Shrukin, and the two children began to move again as well. A deafening roar from Shrukin filled the chamber, and the huge black dragon shook Thorn off his neck, sending the red dragon flying halfway across the room. Thorn landed on his left side, and the bones in his wing broke with a loud snap. I shall not give in, said Galbatorix. Behind the king, Aragon saw Arya, who is closer to the throne than Aragon, hesitate and look back at them. Then she sprinted past the dice and ran with Sephira toward Shrukin. Thorn struggled to his feet and followed. His face contorted like a madman's. Galvatorix strode toward Aragon and swung Vronger at him. Aragon rolled to the side and heard the sword strike the stone by his head. He kept rolling for another few feet, then pushed himself into a standing position. Only the energy from the Eldunari allowed him to remain upright. Shouting, Galvatorix charged at him and Aragon deflected the king's clumsy blow. Their swords rang like bells, sharp and clear amid the roars of dragons and the whispers of the dead. Sephira leaped high into the air and batted at Shrukin's enormous snout, bloodying it, then dropped back to the floor. He swung a paw at her, talons extended, and she hopped backward, half-spreading her rings. Aragon ducked a savage crosscut and stabbed at Galbatorix's left armpit. To his astonishment, he scored a hit, wetting the tip of Brisinger with the king's blood. A spasm in Galbatorix's arm threw off his next strike, and they ended up with their swords locked at the hilt, both striving to push the other off balance. The king's face was twisted almost beyond recognition, and there were tears on his cheeks. A sheet of flame erupted over their heads, and the air grew hot around them. Somewhere the children were screaming. Aragon's wounded leg gave way, and he fell back onto his hands and feet bruising the fingers with which he held Brisinger. He expected the king to be upon him within a second, but instead Galbatorx remained where he was, swaying from side to side. No! cried the king. I didn't! He looked at Aragon and shouted. 
Make it stop! Aragon shook his head, even while he scrambled back onto his feet. Pain shot through his left arm, and he looked over to see Sephira with a bloody gash on her corresponding foreleg. On the other side of the room, Thorn sank his teeth into Shrukin's tail, causing the black dragon to snarl and turn on him. While Shrukin's attention was directed elsewhere, Sephira sprang upward and landed atop his neck, close to the base of his bony skull. She hooked her claws under his scales and then bit down on his neck between two of the spikes that ran along his spine. Shrukin let out a rumbling, savage yowl and began to thrash about even more. Once again, Galbatorx ran at Aragon, slashing at him as he did. Aragon blocked one blow, then another, and then took a hit on his ribs, which nearly caused him to black out. Make it stop, said Galbatorx, his tone more pleading than threatening. The pain! Another yowl, this one more frantic than the last, came from Shrukin. Behind the king, Aragon saw Thorn clinging to Shrukin's neck, opposite Sephira. The combined weight of the two dragons pulled down Shrukin's head until it was close to the floor. However, the black dragon was still too large and strong for them to subdue. Moreover, his neck was so thick, Aragon did not think either Sephira or Thorn would be able to hurt him much with their teeth. Then, like a shadow flitting through a forest, Aragon saw Arya dart out from behind a pillar and run toward the dragons. In her left hand, the green douth dart glowed with its usual starry nimbus. Shrukin saw her coming and jerked his body, trying to dislodge Sephira and Thorn. When they remained affixed, he snarled and opened his jaws and painted the area in front of him with a torrent of fire. Arya dove forward, and for a moment, Aragon lost sight of her behind the wall of flames. Then she came into view again, not far from where Shrukin's head hung above the floor. The ends of her hair were on fire, but she seemed not to notice. With three bounding steps, she leaped onto Shrukin's left forefoot, and from there flung herself toward the side of his head, trailing fire like a comet. Uttering a shout that could be heard throughout the throne room, Arya threw the douth dart into the center of Shrukin's great, gleaming, ice-blue eye and buried the full length of the spear within his skull. Shrukin bellowed and twitched, and then he slowly fell sideways, liquid fire pouring from his mouth. Sephira and Thorn jumped clear a moment before the gigantic black dragon struck the floor. Pillars cracked, chunks of stone fell from the ceiling and shattered. A number of lanterns broke, and gouts of some molten substance dribbled out of them. Aragon nearly fell as the room shuddered. He had not been able to see what happened to Arya, but he feared that Shrukin's bulk might have crushed her. Aragon! shouted Elba. Duck! He ducked, and he heard a whistle of wind as Galbatorix's white blade swung over his lowered back. Rising, Aragon lunged forward and stabbed Galbatorix in the center of his stomach, even as he had stabbed Murtag. The king grunted, and then he stepped back, pulling himself off Aragon's blade. He touched the wound with his free hand and stared at the blood on the tips of his fingers. Then he looked back at Aragon and said, The voices, the voices are terrible. I can't bear it. He closed his eyes, and fresh tears streamed down his cheeks. Pain, so much pain, so much grief. Make it stop, make it stop. No, said Aragon. Elva joined him, as did Sephira and Thorn from the other end of the room. With them... Aragon was relieved to see, was Arya, burned and bloodied, but otherwise unhurt. Galvatorix's eyes snapped open, round and rimmed with an unnatural amount of white, and he stared into the distance, as if Aragon and those before him no longer existed. He shook and trembled and his jaw worked, but no sound came from his throat. Two things happened at once, then. Elva let out a shriek and fainted, and Galvatorix shouted, Was I night? Be not. Aragon had no time for words. Again, drawing upon the Eldunari, he cast a spell to drag himself, Sephira, Arya, Elva, Thorn, Murtag, and the two children on the dice over to the block of stone where Nosuedo was chained, and he also cast a spell to stop or deflect whatever might harm them. They were only halfway to the block when Galbatorix vanished in a flash of light brighter than the sun. Then all went black and silent as Aragon's protective spell took effect.